Hello, VueConf Toronto. Uh, Evan Yo here, and today I'm going to be talking about Vite and VitePress. So, what is Vite? I've gotten this question quite a few times, and um, honestly, I've had a hard time trying to properly explain what it is in a few sentences uh, because there are a lot of things that I that are a lot of things that needs to be explained to for people to probably understand what Vite is, what it does, uh, what problems it's trying to solve, and what makes it different from some of the prior existing solutions. Um, so I feel it's best to dedicate a talk to it um, to, to properly answer these questions. So let's get into it. Uh, now, first thing first, the name Vite comes from French. Uh, it's not pronounced Vite. Uh, it's Vite in French, and it means rapid quickly. And you'll see why I picked this name uh, very soon. Functionally, Vite is similar to a pre-configured Webpack plus Webpack Dev server configuration, um, but faster. Obviously, there are a few other differences. Uh, for example, Webpack is uh, much more battle tested. It has a longer history. It handles a, a tons of edge cases really, really well. Um, it can bundle common JS uh, dependencies by default. Um, and um, Feet is designed to be a bit more future oriented. It assumes you're writing native ES modules code, you know, source code. And um, while it can handle some common JS packages, uh, its uh, compatibility with legacy packages that are having a lot of edge case behaviors may not be as robust and complete as Webpack. So these are just things to take into account. But um, the idea is uh, on a general level, Yes, uh, if you have a Webpack and Webpack Dev Server based setup uh, for a view project um, and you are building it, you're building it for targeting modern browsers, then it is theor theoretically uh, feasible to use Vite in place of Webpack for this purpose. Um, and uh, But you, you'll have to try it yourself to see whether Vite actually fits your requirement. That said, what makes Vite special? What makes it worthwhile for you to consider uh, using it? Well, most importantly, it's fast. That's why we picked the name, right? Like really fast. Uh, if you uh, try to uh, try Vite with a um, with the create Vite app and create a new Vite project, the server almost always starts in under 300 milliseconds. Uh, It'll probably be slower the first time because there is a step, a, a dependency optimization step that we will talk about in a bit. But once you uh, have started for the first time, uh, and as long as your dependencies haven't changed, every time you restart the server, it's going to be uh, under 300 milliseconds, and it's it feels instant. Uh, same for hot module replacement updates. Uh, no matter the size of the application, even with hundreds of modules, when you edit a file, it's always reflected instantly in the browser. And you kind of have to try it yourself uh, to, to fill it. And um, also, Vite comes with built in support for TypeScript transformation in JSX, and, um, and it's using ESBuild. ESBuild is a native uh, tool, it's written in Go, compiled to native code. And uh, but it does JavaScript-based transforms. Now uh, ESForm is also a bundler, but um, we'll talk about how it fits into Vite uh, in a bit. Um, but just so you know, even during development, we're using ESBuild to transform uh, TS source files and JSX files, and it's blazing fast. It's uh, significantly faster than the than the actual TSC compiler. It's uh, I think it's at least 20 to 30 times faster. So uh, this difference is going to be significant in TypeScript based projects as well. And more importantly, uh, it compiles files on demand. Uh, it only process modules of the current split sub subset of your entire application. So <clears throat> we'll see what that really means. Um, with some more explanation just in a moment. But here is just some numbers to get a better, better sense of how fast it really is. Uh, so I created a new Vue 3 project with the same source code. Uh, I have 
uh, 10 components. Um, this is not by no means a big app, but when you try to start it uh, with Vue CLI, it consistently takes close uh, more than two and a half seconds uh, on my machine, which is a MacBook Pro, uh, to start the project. Just to start the server, you have to wait two and a half seconds. And this scales significantly as the number of modules and components increases in your application. Right? Uh, especially when you have a lot of dependencies and hundreds of modules in your, your application. Uh, I think if you've worked on any uh, non trivial sized app, uh, application with Webpack or VCI, you'll know what I mean, right? It can take up to like 10 seconds, 20 seconds to just start the dev server sometimes. Now, with Vite, the code start, the server start time is always going to be under 300 milliseconds. Um, well, so if you have a lot of dependencies, the first time you run it, it'll have to go through a step to pre-optimize dependencies. But once it's done that, every subsequent server start is going to be 200, 300 milliseconds. And it doesn't change no matter how big your application is. Now, um, there's a catch, right? The page load time. Uh, Vue CLI page uh, during development actually loads a little bit faster. Th no, this is the dev server page load time. It's not the production page load time. So when opening a dev server page, uh, Vue CLI can be slightly faster than Vite. Um, this is because Vite uses native ES modules, so there is some HTTP overhead, which we'll also explain a bit later. But the general idea is page load will be slightly slower. But as you can see, if we add the server start time and the page load time together, uh, feed it would be around 600 milliseconds and view CLI would come close to three seconds. So it is still a pretty significant difference, right? Um, and in terms of build time, with the same source code, um, feed is almost twice as fast compared to view CLI. Now, um, this, is, this is not to say feed is designed to completely replace view CLI because the two projects actually have completely different scopes. Vue CLI is a more complete toolchain solution. It handles um, a lot of built-in options. It uh, it gives you options to use Babel, TypeScript, uh, compiling for uh, web components, legacy targets, um, linters, test runners, right? And the, the main value of Vue CLI is that it makes sure all of these things comes together cons uh, and works together consistently. Um, and it also makes sure it's uh, it's battle tested. It uh, covers all the possible edge cases it can. So uh, this is not saying that you should switch to Vite instantly because there might be things you still need from Vue CLI. But Vite is a this new direction that we're exploring, showing potential, showing you know maybe potentially when in the future when the ecosystem catches up, we can all switch to Vite one day. Now, okay, so let's go into a bit more details on exactly what Vite uh, does. So it, first of all, it's Vite has two parts. It has a dev server and it has a build, uh, a build command, okay? So the dev server part is native ES module based and the build part is rollup based. And we'll talk about these one by one. So first, native ES modules based dev server for development. Why? Why do we want to do this? And what is, what does native ES module mean, right? Um, so first of all, traditional bundlers, uh, Webpack, Browserify, if people remember that, um, and uh, even some people who use Rollup for uh, development, right? Uh, these are all still bundler. We call it the bundler-based approach. The idea is you have an entry file or one or more entry file. We will crawl the whole dependency graph. We'll, we'll read every file, parse every file, put everything together, and build all the possible modules in your application into one single bundle, and then serve it, right? So you have to finish that whole process before you can display anything on the screen. That's why the Webpack Dev Server start time is long. Um, the, the work that it's doing includes a full-blown parsing of every single file to, to fully um, understand what it's doing, whether this file is a valid ES module or is it common JS? Does, uh, does Webpack need to do anything special to make it compatible with other modules in the, in the same project? Uh, it has to do this analysis for every single file. 
And whenever it read and parses the file and it imports more files, right? It keeps doing this until all the files are uh, are processed. And then there's algorithms to properly sort, rewrite, and then concatenate everything together to make sure they work together as a single bundle, right? So it finishes that whole process before it can do anything. So this means the bigger your app get, the slower your dev server start startup will be. That's just how it is, right? Um, code splitting helps production performance, but does not really help development performance. And the thing is, um, caching does relatively little uh, in helping with this because um, as long as one file has changed, the whole dependency graph is different. So uh, oftentimes, cache will uh, one file changing will invalidate a big part of the cache graph and cause the, the whole time just to repeat the whole process again. Um, so how do we how do we solve this problem, right? So, uh, so let's uh, just uh, repeat this process, but this time with graphics. So bundle-based dev server starts with an entry. And here we have a hypothetical module graph where the entry has a bunch, imports a bunch of uh, routes, uh, route modules. Uh, assuming we're using a router with code splitting. So each route uh, is using dynamic import to import its route component, where each route component uh, has uh, direct imports to one or more modules. And it's possible for routes to cross import the same module as well. So in a hypothetical graph like this, uh, even though we're code splitting for production, it does not matter in development because uh, the bundlers still have to walk this um, dynamic import graph to put everything into bundles. Uh, it has to make sure uh, everything is available uh, before we can do anything. And it puts things into a bundle, right? So because with code splitting, there might be multiple files in the bundle, because, but the mo these multiple files have to be uh, processed and produ uh, generated first before we can actually serve them, right? So that's the point. That's why it have to preempt eagerly walk the graph. Now let's look at how native ES module based server for development can does it can do it. Um, there are a few other projects like Snowpack and ES Dev Server that follows a similar approach uh, and share some similarities. But here we are specifically talking about how Veach does it. Um, so. In our HTML file, we're going to import our module with script type equals module. Now, this is how you would uh, use native ES modules. Inside script type module, you can use native ES module import and export syntax. Um, and the, this now, when you are in this mode, the browser does the, the parsing. The browser will um, be looking for import and export statements inside your JavaScript code and it will preemptively fetch the files for you via your HTTP requests. And as it, it fetches the file, it also then parses the fetch file, which will in turn fire more requests. So this will result in a, uh, cast, a waterfall network request that uh, just requests the, everything that's in, the, in your Im import graph automatically. And this is done by the browser. Uh, using its native parser, which is highly optimized for this purpose. So it's going to be much faster than, say, doing this same thing with JavaScript-based parsers, right? Um, and now, uh, when the when your browser requests all these modules, they are sent as HTTP requests to the dev server. Now the dev server receives these HTTP requests, read the file from the file system, and send them back. And before it sends it back, it has the opportunity to perform transformations, um, if necessary, right? Uh, the ideal case is we can we can skip the transformation uh, if if we don't need to do anything. Uh, especially when we are because we are already using native ES modules, the browser is considered to be modern, most likely an evergreen browser, so it su already supports most of the latest syntax ES syntax that you'd want to use. So um, uh, in a lot of cases, you probably don't even need Babel which is why Vite does not include Babel by default, right? So that saves a ton of time as well. Okay. Uh, it is important to mention the uh, the previous comparison uh, comparing VCI and Vite does intentionally uh, excludes Babel from the VCI configuration as well. So there's no cost of 
double transpilation in there. Okay. Now let's take a look at the graph of how a uh, native ESM based dev server do things, right? When you start the server, the cost of uh, the, the work to be done is constant. The server will always be ready uh, instantly. And then when you open the page, it sends an, uh, it loads the HTML page, right? And then which can includes a script type module link to your actual entry file. Now it sends an HTTP request to the entry file. Uh, the browser will natively parse your entry file and find these dynamic imports, right? Now, the dynamic imports are in the file, but they will only fire when your application logic is executed to actually call that dynamic import uh, statement. Now, because you're working on only one route at a time, so the other routes that are not actually imported in your current route won't even be imported. Right? The browser will only make one single HTTP request to the specific route you're working on, which then in turn make more HTTP requests to the module that belongs to that route. This is what we mean by uh, on-demand loading, and this is what why uh, it's important to emphasize uh, the native ESM-based approach makes code splitting benefit dev server performance as well. Right. Uh, this this difference can be particularly huge in an application with dozens of routes, where each route may contain a hundred modules, right? Um, then your whole application can go up to a thousand modules, which will take a whole lot of time for Webpack to process before it can even start the dev server. But in the case of Vite, uh, at, at any time when you work on a specific route, you're loading a hundred modules max, right? So that's going to be uh, a lot of dip, uh, a ton of difference uh, com comparing the whole time from starting the server to actually seeing something on the screen. Okay, so uh, we see the benefits of the native ES module based approach, but it's not without downsides, right? So let's talk about them. Um, the first problem when we uh, when when we started to to experiment with this approach is notice that uh, native ES module naturally creates an HTTP request waterfall. As we can see here, you need to first uh, complete the request to fetch the entry file before you can you know that you will need the next file. Again, you need to fetch this next file before you know you need these other files. Right? It's better when when you have this file that that has uh, contains multiple imports because then the browser can send three parallel HTTP requests to get those three modules together. But still, we are going through at least two waterfalls here already. Now, luckily, because it's a local dev server, the latency isn't really an issue, right? It, it's going to always be instant. It's like going through, through from your local disk. Um, so like it, it's going to be faster on an SSD than a traditional hard disk, but uh, still the, the time, the latency is negligible. Um, the, the actual overhead comes in how browser uh, sends the HTTP request, uh, processing all the headers for your server to read stuff from the disk. Uh, one by one, and um, have to process them and send them back. So there, when you have, when you are, also there's a limitation where the browser can make and mask uh, at max uh, half a dozen uh, HTTP requests in parallel. Uh, it varies from browser, but I believe uh, in Chrome you can make like six requests in parallel at max. Um, so without HTTP two, uh, you would still have some level of what we call um, HTTP request congestion if you're making a ton of requests at the same time. So this is particularly prominent when you um, when you have a large dependency with a lot of internal modules. And that's that was the first problem that we ran into when we first experimented with this approach is uh, I tried to import Lodash ES and it takes it freezes the page by like two to three seconds uh, because Lodash ES has over 600 internal modules, and we're loading like, and and we're sending like 700, six to 700 parallel requests at the same time. Uh, it's not even a waterfall, right? Uh, so it creates a lot of congestion. It takes like two seconds to load the page, um, which is obviously not ideal. Actually, it it causes the the every reload to take two seconds. So uh, we want to make sure that we don't um, 
growing to this situation. So uh, the first optimization that V does automatically for you is the step what we call optimizing the pre-optimizing the dependencies, pre-bundling them. Uh, this optimization is really just for reducing the number of HTTP requests that you want to do. And also, um, um, because this is assuming that uh, your dependencies uh, do not change, right? Uh, because we know the dependencies, once you have pinged a version and installed it into your project, the code never changes. So why not just pre-bundle it so that um, instead of making 600 requests, uh, when you import lodash es, we make one single request, right? Now, um, it, it might be a bit, uh, some people might be thinking, um, why can't we actually load things on demand when we are using a lodash es? Isn't that the whole point of ESM? Well, uh, unfortunately, ESM, uh, when you load it via native ESM, it's actually uh, eager, right? The tree shaking the, uh, the on-demand tree shake actually happens only in production. So without uh, explicit code splitting, during development, it's actually going to eagerly try to fetch everything in the import graph. So which is also why it's important to code split uh, in your own code. Now, you can't really force Lodash to code split stuff for you. So which is this is why uh, V12 do this uh, pre-bundling step. So um, if you have Lodash ES, listed in your package.json dependencies, and you started a uh, Vite server, you will see a step saying, we found this dependency, Lodash ES, that is optimizable, and we will pre-bundle it for you. Now, it will use rollup to pre-bundle your dependencies. And um, actually, if you have multiple optimizable dependencies, they will be bundled in one step together. They will all be used as entries of a rollup bundle, so for each dependency, we will produce one corresponding file. Um, now, there are some heur heuristics to determine whether a dependency really needs to be bundled, right? So there are two categories. First is uh, it is actually shipping ES modules. However, it, uh, it has a lot of internal modules. That is uh, ES, ES, Lodash ES, right? It has one entry file that has imports to hundreds of internal modules. So in this case, you would definitely need to pre-bundle it into one single file. Um, still ESM, but now it's one request. Uh, another case is CommonJS. Now, um, Veed has a uh, Veed has a certain level of support for CommonJS dependencies. Um, we are actually still hashing this out. There are um, the edge case where um, has to do with named imports from CommonJS modules, uh, especially for dependencies that dynamically register named imports. Um, this is the case where the rollup common JS plugin is still trying to solve, and we some have a PR on the way to fix this. Um, but before that, um, as long as you're, it's a common JS dependency, but doesn't have all these like dynamically set named exports, then we can actually handle it pretty well. So it, it will attempt to bundle this common JS dependency also into a single file as an ES module so that it can be loaded in your browser, right? So um, with this step done, now we ensure there's at most one request per dependency. So if you have like 10, 20 dependencies, that's still going to be resolved in only 10 to 20 requests, which is going to be uh, significantly more efficient. Another optimization we're going to do is uh, the serve leverage server caching, right? So we have e tags uh, and uh, mod not modify headers from the server, so that once files are have been loaded and processed by the server, the next time you request it, it's going to tell you it's uh, 304. So every time you reload the page, um, only the um, only the actual change files will have to go through the full server processing cycle to be sent back. Uh, the browser, in a in a lot of cases, can um, get a 304 and load it from the local disk cache. And third optimization is code split, right? Now, this step requires the user to actually do it. But um, the important thing here, as we mentioned, is um, this whole approach makes code split improves both dev and prop performance. 
And this forces you to think about code splitting during development, right? Uh, when you are doing traditional bundler-based development, um, code splitting is almost always an afterthought uh, because it does not have any impact on your development experience. So you work, 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 and you finish the app. It, it loads really well. Uh, it performs well b locally because um, you're loading the whole app. Uh, there's no latency, right? Uh, and you're, you're kind of used to this whole responsiveness locally, but you don't realize after you deploy, you're actually deploying maybe hundreds of kilobytes of JavaScript without code splitting, and your user may have to wait a much longer uh, on, on a slow device, right? So um, having uh, having the, uh, the, this, the number of modules that's being loaded, the number of code being loaded uh, directly reflected in your local de development experience, right? Uh, and when you realize, okay, it, it feels like slow because we're loading too many th stuff, uh, maybe we can code split this so that um, my local development server becomes faster when working on this specific subset of my application. This means your production users will also be loading it faster, right? So this kind of aligns your uh, development development experience with the user experience, which I think is good for pushing us to, to build more efficient applications. Okay, so that was the HTTP request problem. Another problem that we want to solve is uh, native ESM doesn't really support bare imports yet, right? So in a Webpack-based setup, it's very common for us to write code like this. You can import create app from view. Uh, here we're directly importing from view because we know it's installed as a uh, npm dependency in your package JSON, but the browser doesn't really know that, right? Um, so how do we make this work? We want to provide, so in Vite, we want to provide the, the a close development experience as close to VCLI as possible. So you'll be able to import directly from your npm dependencies. You'll be able to directly import view files, CSS, JSON, every uh, TypeScript, anything uh, you can think of. Most of them will be supported out the box. Um, but bare imports is not something you can do natively uh, with ESM. So how how do we do that, right? So there is a spec called import maps that's going to address this at the browser native level, but it's not standardized yet. Um, unlike ES modules, which is actually a standard and is working in all the latest major browsers, right? Uh, so what can we do now um, without relying on something that's not standardized yet? Um, so what well, the approach we're taking is um, when, whenever we are about to send back a JavaScript file, we will use uh, ES module lexer, which is also a um, written compiled to native code that lexes your um, the module that's being sent back and look for import statements. It does not do a full AST parse, so it's extremely fast. And then when we detect those, um, so the only thing it gives you back is a list of imports and their locations in the source file, right? But that information is already enough for us to do lightweight modifications on the source code using the excellent magic stream module, um, so which allows us to uh, do very lightweight uh, additions while generating corresponding source maps. Now. Um, with this combination, we can uh, partially rewrite the import paths in your source code uh, at a very low cost without doing full AST parses, which is a lot of bundlers would have to do in the first place, right? So it's going to be uh, like less than one milliseconds for most files, uh, one or two milliseconds max. Um, and um, this is the rewrite result. So we'll rewrite a bare import into something like this, slash app modules view. Now this becomes a valid uh, native request and we'll actually send it on, uh, using this path as an HTTP request to the server. Now our dev server obviously will have a special route handling this. So it sees, okay, this incoming request is under the slash app modules special route. So uh, it means I need to look into our npm dependencies and look for a module named view. And um, this is the part where the dev server will do some work uh, following the node uh, resolving algorithm, uh, get the file, um, uh, look, uh, determine the entry file, 
if the entry is a valid ESM file, we will serve it. And remember the step where we uh, pre-optimize pre dependencies, right? The actual first step here is to look for inside the optimized dependency list to see if the module is pre-optimized. Um, if there is, we will use the optimized version. Otherwise, we'll use what's actually in the NPM packages, um, in, the, in the node modules. Um, and um, we'll also catch the, the resolved result so that next time you request the same file, it'll just directly return the cache result, right? Okay, so that was uh, how we handle bare imports. And similarly, uh, when you import uh, other files, for example, uh, a view file, right? This, again, the server, the dev server in Veed is actually a COA server. So for each special file type that we want to handle, we simply add a middleware into Koa that checks, okay, this request is a view request. We need to use the view compiler to compile it before we send it back. This is a CSS file. We need to convert it into uh, process with post CSS and then send it back as JavaScript string, uh, JavaScript string if necessary, right? So we can do all of this on the server. Um, some uh, this actually may remind uh, some users of an old approach, approach where uh, in the past you have required JS or uh, system JS, uh, where you would actually do the same on-demand approach, uh, with except that every com all the compilation is actually done in the browser. So you have to have all these transformations available in the browser, uh, which has its uh, strict, uh, very, very serious limitations because you cannot, you, you need all the transformations to be usable in the browser. You can't use any node-based tools. But since in the dev server approach, all the compilation is still happening on the server side uh, inside Node.js. So we can leverage all the uh, available uh, node modules to, to do, you can use post-CSS, uh, you can use preprocessors like less SAS TypeScript, anything you can think of, and you can even use these uh, dedicated tools that's uh, you, compiled to native, like ES Build for, for processing, which isn't really runnable in the browser, right? So that's the advantage of this approach. Okay, so, um, so after we've tackled this uh, performance issue and, and we've tackled uh, the um, native imports, a different import type issue, uh, the, the final challenge when we were working on V is really how to tackle hot module replacement over native ES modules. And this was one of the main thing that we, I wanted to tackle when, when we, when working on V because, um, the original idea of a, a dev server ES module dev based dev server actually came up, uh, more than one year ago before I actually start working on beat. Uh, it's called uh, at view slash dev server. It's, it's now an archive project, but the first iteration is essentially an initial prototype for Vite. Um, it's, um, so Vite has been out for a couple months. So the original idea came about one and a half years ago. And at that time, native ES module was still not so widely supported. So um, the idea was more like a prototype and uh, just, uh, just an experiment. But now uh, it's much. It has a much more wider support and in all the major browsers for us to actually put this out as a feasible uh, solution that's usable today. Now, um, so in the early prototype, uh, the thing I did not figure out was hot module replacement, and the reason I started working on Vite was I was rehashing this idea, and I suddenly realized a way to actually do hot module replacement over ESM. And that was one of the mo major motivation for for me to start the project, um, kind of like the, that aha moment, right? So uh, the limitation here is that there in there is no actual way to to say swap a native VS module uh, dynamically when when your page is still running, right? But hot module replacement requires us to be able to do that uh, without reloading the page. So here's how we do it. The first thing is um, in our pre pre previous step, right, um, we mentioned that uh, we need to actually use ES module lexer to look for the import statements inside every file we sent back. So that is an opportunity for us to actually record this import 
graph relationships. So as we use ES module Lexer to lex all the imports, we also record them. So after we've served all the file to the client, we would have constructed a module import graph. So for every given file that's changed, right, we can we can actually trace its import import parent import chain. Right. Okay. So the next step is um, we need a way, we need to provide some hint for a module to declare itself as what we call an edge hot module replacement boundary. Now a lot of these concepts are inspired by uh, Webpack, which is the original uh, project that, that came up with all this uh, hot module replacement terminology and uh, APIs. So uh, a big inspiration there, but uh, the, the actual implementation is probably very, very different now. Now, but the, the same idea is we will use an API called uh, hot.accept. In Webpack, it's module.hot.accept. Here we are attaching it to import meta because that's what's a, um, that's more specific to native VS modules. Now, um, Veach will attach this to import meta during development mode. And if your code contains a call to this, Veach will, Veach will actually notice it and say, okay, this file is a boundary that accepts hot updates from some of its dependency modules. Now, <clears throat> uh, you don't have to really use this manually. You can if you want to, but when you say using uh, view with Vite, uh, the, the view compilation step already automatically inject calls like this for you. So the um, when you write a view file, it gets compiled to JavaScript before sent to the client, and that code will already contain this, which makes each view file automatically a hot module replacement boundary. So um, when you change something, when you change a file, now a view file is a boundary. Uh, a boundary can also self-accept. So when you edit the template of a view file, for example, um, we will then find that file and trace its import graph. The, the template is actually imported by the view file. So view file actually creates uh, virtual modules for, for the template, for its script part, and other things. Now, but even if it's not a view file, it's a manual uh, boundary and uh, Im which imports a file, and we edit that imported file. V12 then try to use our pre previously recorded import graph information to trace its parent chain and until we reach a hot module replacement boundary. Okay, so once we find a boundary, uh, we will then send a WebSocket event to the client. Um, each hot module replacement boundary, when you call hot.accept, register a callback to receive message from the server. Now, when it receives that signal, it will send an HTTP request to request this change module again from the server, which gets the updated code, and then reapply the updates. Now, in some cases, when you um, when you change a file, it's possible for it to uh, for its parent chain to not contain any boundaries. So it's possible to uh, trace all the way to the root to your, to our entry file. Uh, so this means um, there is no explicit code to handle the potential changes uh, that's happened in this file. So the only way to ensure correctness is to fully reload the page. So that's why um, if you say you edit the root index.js, main.js in your feed application, the whole page will reload because that is the only way for it to ensure correctness without any code that uh, then knows what to do when the file has changed, right? Uh, in comparison, if there is a boundary here, which is a view file, and then notice, okay, my template has changed, right? It will call views internal hot module replacement APIs to say this component's com template has changed. Let's re-render it, right? So that's the side effects that needs to happen for, for the changes to reflect. But if there is no defined side effects for a change to be reflected, then we reload the whole page. Okay, so that's how hot module replacement works over ES modules. And now we are getting into uh, the build section, right? So that was the dev server. I hope that explained what uh, the whole native DS module based approach is. Um, 
yes, I forgot to mention that uh, this approach is very efficient because um, the the work that we're doing here is really really light. Um, in most cases, all of this happens in a few milliseconds. The the majority of the time is actually spent in recompiling the actual file and then the HTTP overhead. So uh, in a lot of cases, the moment you hit save, the change is already reflected in the browser. Uh, sometimes it could be so fast that you won't even notice it. But um, still, um, this uh, uh, in, in my experience, sometimes in a big webpack project, after I hit uh, hit save, it can take up to like two to three seconds uh, for webpack to stop processing stuff and for the changes to ref to be reflected in the browser. But in Vite, no matter how big the project is, it's almost always instant because um, because the work we're doing, we don't have to re uh, compute the whole graph relationship. Uh, this this relationship is already stored and tracing this is extremely fast. There's like really little work to be done here. Okay, so uh, roller-based build for production. Now, the why. Um, so there is uh, uh, there are other um, similar solutions. So first of all, obviously rollup is faster than Webpack. Uh, but the uh, the biggest downside, oh, it's also built around ES modules, right? Rollup is a ES module first bundler. And it's also the best at tree shaking logic to produce the smallest bundle possible. So, um, and it aligns really well with Vite's premise that uh, you should be using native ES modules as much as possible. So, um, but why we are still building for production? Why don't we just ship native ES modules to production? Well, as you can see, uh, when you ship it to production, uh, you still have to deal with the HTTP request waterfall problem, um, even with HTTP2. Uh, it's still uh, with actual latency between your server and your user. It's still non negligible, right? The performance is still really hard to get right if you use native ES modules in production, which is why we still want to go through a bundle step for production to ensure the best possible performance in uh, in production. Um, the how, right? Um, I don't know if any of uh, any of you have actually used Rollup to bundle your application before. Uh, we do have an official Rollup plugin, View plugin, uh, but Configuring Rollup to work properly handles CSS, um, view files, TypeScript, and everything it can be a pretty involved process. The configuration is technically simpler than Webpack, but uh, unlike Webpack, where there are so many starter kits and boilerplates and tutorials, I'll teach you how to do it. Um, sometimes it can be rather difficult for for um, for for someone who's new to Rollup to properly configure everything uh, to work together. So um, Luckily, Vite kind of do that already for you. So anything that the dev server can handle, we have corresponding configuration pre-configured in Rollup to make it work. Now, um, so it's it's pre-configured. So as long uh, if the same code works on the dev server side, then we will be able to handle it during production and bundle it properly. Um, the good part is a decent number of the module transformation logic can be reused. It's shared between the dev server and the build process. Um, for example, how to how to transform CSS, right? The majority of the logic is the same uh, during dev and pr production. Uh, Vite also pro provides a an, an abstract, a universal transform API that will work both during dev and production so that you don't have to say you want to add a custom handling for a custom file type for example um, a special a file with a special extension with some custom transformations right uh, in a bundler like with webpack you will you, you will write a loader uh, with um, with rollup you will have to use a plugin uh, with a code dev server you'd have to write middleware but um, so in the case of Vite, technically it will need a core middleware plus a roller plugin, but we've abstracted both together into a single transform API. So you just need to provide a function that takes some input code, returns the transform code, um, and uh, it will be used both in the dev server and the rollup bundling process. So you don't have to do both. Okay, so um, 
it's really, really easy to get started with Vite. Uh, just run npm init Vite app, and you can create a Vite app today. Uh, and it's also really light. Uh, installation is pretty fast. Um, or if you use yarn, you can do yarn create Vite app. Uh, both of these are just alias to calling the actual package, which is create Vite app. It's on GitHub. It has a number of different templates. And it's important to note that Vite is actually framework agnostic. Uh, although it was created primarily uh, to serve um, to 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 be to work well with Vue, it doesn't mean it's tailored specifically for Vue. It has a bunch of Vue specific op optimizations, but it's perfectly um, feasible to use Vite with any other app, uh, any other frameworks. For example, with React, you can do npm in a V app dash dash template React. Uh, we have a bunch of templates. Uh, we have Preact, Preact TS, React TS, Vue TS, uh, and there's also uh, it is also possible to build higher level tools on top of Vite because Vite does expose uh, its Dev Server API. You can programmatically create a server. You can call Vite to build something uh, to to build a rollup bundle programmatically as well. So it's, you can build, use these APIs to build higher level tools on top of Vite. So uh, there is a tool called Svite, uh, which is um, a higher level dev server, uh, a tool built on top of Vite to work with Svelte applications as well. Right. So Vite is actually a framework agnostic tool. It's not only for Vue. OK, so that is it for Vite. Um, so next we'll get into VitePress. Okay, so now let's talk about VitePress. Um, VitePress is a static site generator built on top of Vite and V3, right? As I said, Vite exposes programmatic APIs for you to build higher level tools on top of it. And VitePress is exactly uh, what it is. Uh, what, what we're doing here is uh, calling Vite's uh, create server API to uh, dynamically create a server and then we inject custom logic to handle uh, markdown files so um, it's still experimental but um, it has a lot of potential and we're already using it to power some of the documentations of our uh, new uh, new versions of these uh, core libraries like the router and Vuex so um, Functionality-wise, it's like ViewPress. Yes, uh, it's like the little brother of ViewPress, but it's faster, lighter, and more minimalistic. Um, it will, when you use it, um, if you have, you only use ViewPress for the very, very basic features, like just default configuration, default theme with a bunch of markdown files, uh, generates a documentation site, it'll be almost exactly the same, except be, uh, the dev server starts much faster and the edits will reflect much faster. Right, and that these are the um, drawbacks of ViewPress. Essentially, the itches that I'm trying to scratch for myself is uh, when I use ViewPress to work on documentation sites, and especially when a site uh, has a lot of pages. Right, the more pages you have in a ViewPress site, the slower the server starts. But is it really necessary? Because most of the time, we're only ever going to be working on a single page at a time. What's the point of compiling all these other pages? Uh, before we can actually start the dev server, right? And then there is a slow edit feedback. When you have, um, I'm not sure why, but when I have a documentation site uh, with like 20 to 30 pages, uh, and I'm editing this single markdown file, it takes like two to three seconds for it to be reflected in the screen. It just, this whole slow feedback loop just uh, completely breaks the flow uh, of um, the flow of, of writing. So I want to, uh, essentially create something that brings back that instant bit feedback feel like the moment I hit save I want to see the screen update right and that is what Vite makes available right Vite press uh, built on top of Vite instead of webpack uh, gives that give you that instant server start give you that instant uh, HMR feedback um, so this is most important part in the development experience in terms of um, writing uh, writing as a uh, preview as you write, right? Um, so there is another issue in ViewPress that 
that's also solved by VPress specifically. That is the double payload problem, right? So to explain what the problem is, we'll have to go back to um, I have to go back a bit about what VPress and VPress, uh, what kind of static site generators they are. Uh, this they are what I what I call single page application static site generators. Um, and if you know Gatsby, which is big in the React ecosystem, it falls under the same categories. These are single page application static site generators that allows you to uh, to write the template. Um, the theme uh, of your application um, using single page application frameworks like React or Vue, right? You can write your theme as Vue components or React components, uh, but it actually leverages the framework's server side rendering capabilities to pre render every route in your application into a dedicated HTML file. So then it's deployed as a static site. So when you visit a, a specific route directly, you'll get the pre-rendered HTML, right? And then you also get the JavaScript bundle that contains all the code that hydrates the page. Um, so it's like a server-side server -side rendered app, is, except that the, the server rendering is done ahead of time. Then it gets hydrated on the client, um, and the, the client app suddenly becomes a single page application. So when you uh, visit the initial route and then try to click a button and visit the next link, it's actually going to be a single page application navigation. It's going to be fetching a code split chunk of JavaScript and dynamically render the new content instead of going through the whole page load process again. So uh, the benefits of this model is first you have uh, the development experience and user experience of a single page application. Um, so you can leverage all the knowledge you can. You can leverage all the ecosystem of your framework. You can uh, you can even uh, have you can you can use basically develop your theme like a just normal single page application with arbitrarily complex interaction that you want. Um, it also provides a user experience of a single page application because all the subsequent navigations are very snappy. It's fetching the the next chunk of content dynamically without reloading the whole page, right? And it also has the benefit of the SEO and loading initial loading performance of a static site because the content is pre-rendered. It it is actually a static file when when you first, uh, hit the initial visit, right? So it's kind of the best of both worlds, but it's not uh, it comes not without cost. Um, now, to go a bit step further, there is also this concept of dynamic markdown, right? Uh, in ViewPress specifically, every markdown file that you write is actually compiled into a view template first. Then it gets compiled by the view compiler into JavaScript, right? Um, what, the reason why we do this is so that because they're actually compiled into view templates, this means you can use view components inside your markdown, right? So um, what this in entails is that you can have a fully static markdown page, but you can then embed a few dynamic components inside of it. Um, so uh, this allows you to have maybe a dynamic section. For example, you're building a documentation site, and you want to embed a demo in your uh, in, in inside your static markdown, right? Uh, in a traditional static site generator, you would have to um, you would have to write your markdown completely static uh, in a completely static fashion. Then maybe leave a uh, leave an empty div with an ID hook. Then you need to somehow inject some specific JavaScript for that page to attach logic into this static markdown uh, static markdown page, right? And that workflow is uh, not ideal. It's tedious, to be honest. And that's what we've been doing with the the version two documentation of, of our v2 documentation of Vue.js, right? Um, we are using Hexo, which is a traditional static site generator. So every page, every mark markdown page is purely static, and then we have to find ways to insert, inject these demos all over the place. And it's honestly um, not very clean. Uh, it gets very dirty over time. So uh, this dynamic markdown approach allows you to actually author the dynamic parts 
completely using your uh, as a view component and then just embed it anywhere you want inside your markdown, right? This is great for development experience, but it comes as a co at a cost, right? Um, there is a similar approach in React uh, called MDX, right? It's pretty much the same idea. Uh, now, this dynamic markdown thing is really cool, but it again, it comes at a cost. So SPSSG and dynamic markdown together both requires both are compiling your markdown as component code. So the the problem it creates is that um, it's in, compiled into JavaScript render functions. It's compiling the whole markdown file into JavaScript. So um, now the markdown is rendered, compiled into JavaScript, and server rendered into HTML. So when the user visits the page, it first gets the full HTML payload, which contains some static content and some some of the markdown is for purely static content. Some of the markdown is for dynamic content. And then it downloads a JavaScript pillow that includes the compiled render function for that same content again. And then it performs a full hydration on the client, including hydration for the static parts as well. Right? You, we can see how, uh, how much unnecessary work we're doing here. First, we're shipping a ton of JavaScript, and a lot of the JavaScript is unnecessary because these static parts, right, these strings, they're already there in the HTML, but we're sending the same strings, same uh, code that dynamically creates these HTML as JavaScript, and then we're hydrating it. What's the point of hydrating static content, right? So, um, but this is what's happening with, uh, with some of the current approaches. Um, so vpress is essentially an attempt to to better optimize this right so dealing with it we can leverage view 3's advanced compiler optimizations to 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 tackle this problem the first thing is view 3 performs something what you call static tree hoisting so uh, if you have a big markdown page with some embedded view components when it's compiled into a view template large parts of this markdown file will be static. And um, if we paste something like that into the view template explorer, this is something you will see, right? This is a compile view render function. The the note the only thing you need to watch watch out for here is this thing. So it's a hoisted node. It's create static V node with a bunch of HTML strings inside of it. And it's marked as pure. It has no side effects. Uh, and contains this string essentially contains all the static static content in your markdown file, right? So um, we already hoist that. Um, this already enables something. Um, it benefits the update performance because uh, during virtual DOM patching, you will know that okay, this is static node. Its content will never change. We don't even need to. Whenever we run into static nodes, we can just skip them and don't don't even touch them, right? And same thing for hydration, right? During hydration on the client, uh, if a uh, view notices that, okay, this part is actually, uh, we're running into a static node here, so its content is going to be exactly the same the way it came from the server. It's never going to change. So what's the point of hydrating it? So we can just skip it, right? So here we, are, we have already uh, saved a lot of computation because now we don't need to actually uh, hydrate every single node in the big static chunk. We can just completely skip them. So now we, we have um, achieved what we call selective hydration. We skip hydration for all the static parts and only target the dynamic pieces uh, in, in the HTML that we're sending. But we're still sending this whole JavaScript bundle. Um, we're still handing this, uh, sending over a, lot, a ton of JavaScript. And how do we do that? now? we do an extra step in vpress uh, essentially we have a post processing uh, pr post processing step after we have generated javascript bundle we locate all these pure static vnode creation calls and simply remove the string right this actually removed the majority of the payload uh, in the in the bundle already right uh, so now the js payload we're actually shipping 
is going to be a render function that's much smaller. It's essentially going to only contain the code that's relevant to the dynamic parts, right? It still have placeholders for these static nodes so that it knows where they are to be able to locate the dynamic parts. But the actual work we're doing really is uh, the hydration is really just check static node, skip, then we are at the dynamic part, the code is here, we hydrate it, and then we run into more static content, skip it, right? So we are sending what is really needed for the client and only hydrating what is really needed on the client. And that's how it should be, right? We shouldn't be wasting payload, we shouldn't be wasting CPU work to do to hydrate stuff that we don't need, right? So that's the ideal situation, and that is exactly what VPress is doing uh, in the production bundle. So um, as a example, uh, we the view router next docs is actually deployed using VPress, right? So if we inspect its um, if we inspect its HTTP request, you can see uh, we have some common JavaScript. That's the theme, and that's the the runtime containing view runtime. And this one that's being highlighted is actually the JavaScript chunk for the current page that is being loaded. And you can see it's only 639 bytes. Um, and it's not a small page. The The whole document is 6.3 KB. So imagine this is a uh, uh, th this is a huge, huge long page, like the composition API RFC, right? It's going to be like 20 to 30 KB of page size. Uh, but even for that page, the JavaScript payload is going to be the same. It's going to be a few hundred bytes. Um, and as we can see, other JavaScript we're loading on the page includes a few a full view 3 runtime plus the base single page application part of Vite itself and the default uh, documentation theme with all the uh, like uh, with all the page switching uh, like highlighting in the sidebar, dynamic navigation plus um, outbound links rendering, uh, search boxes and all that. Add it together, that's 25.8 kilobytes of JavaScript and you're shipping next to nothing additionally for each page. So all of these shared parts, they are the same for every page. So when you switch to the next page, uh, uh, you are only fetching the additional content for that page. Now, there's one thing here, right? We can only do this uh, tiny payload for the initial load because uh, if we think about the amount of information we're sent to the client, right? Um, we're sending all the content. The content is either in the pre-rendered HTML or it is or it's in the JavaScript bundle, right? We managed to eliminate this duplication between the HTML and the JavaScript for the initial load. But for subsequent loads, um, if you fetch a new page dynamic dynamically, we no longer get the static HTML from the server. So we need to make sure that the for single page application navigations, we are actually um, we are actually getting the um, uh, we're actually getting a JavaScript bundle that contains uh, contains the content in the JavaScript. So that's why we have uh, this uh, system where VPress will produce two versions of JavaScript bundle for a uh, JavaScript file for each page. Right? It will have a page.md.js, which is the full payload that's used for single page application navigation, and it will have a page.md.lean.js that is with static content removed, and that is only loaded for initial page loads. And it will intelligently pick the right file to use, uh, depending on whether this is an initial visit or subsequent navigation. So this is all handled for you. And we can optimize this even further, right? Um, so there are bundle size optimizations, for example, in ViewPress, uh, due to the code splitting and file name hashing, right? We're adding uh, quite a bit of metadata for every additional page. So once you add a page, it bloats the common share JavaScript bundle of every single page by 200 bytes. So imagine if you add, you have a site of 100 pages, you're shipping 20 KB of JavaScript just in manifest information. Uh, so VPress uses a custom setup routing solution that minimizes this cost uh, by tenfold. So even with 100 pages, you're only shipping 2 KB of manifest information. And this is actually also shipped to the client as a, as a string embedded in JavaScript, and then using json.parse to parse it. 
So it's a trick to to make it um, parse faster uh, than shipping it directly as inline JavaScript object, right? So a lot of these small optimizations to maximize the performance. And there are more optimizations we can do, right? We can do built-in viewport-based prefetch, built-in service worker. Uh, we can add view core feature to allow making part of even the component template uh, inside your theme um, to be dynamic only during server-side rendering so that on the client it's treated as a static node. Um, there are even more crazy optimizations for, say, the single-page single, single page application navigation where when you fetch this new page, right, a downside of this is uh, if you have a really long page, you have to load the full page JavaScript to be able to dynamically render it in one go. Um, but if it's fetching HTML, it can actually stream it. So it's technically possible to fetch only the um, to fetch the lean.js and the pre-render HTML in parallel, stream the HTML, and then using lean.js to hydrate it. Right, so that would make the performance even uh, even better. So that's going to be uh, something we're going to look into the fu in future iterations of VPress. Um, but as said, VPress is still a very early stage; is unstable. Uh, but we are test driving it in some of our own documentations, and uh, there's a lot more optimizations to come. And we honestly believe that VPress is going to be probably the one of the best performing. SPA style static site generators out there you can you can ever find so um, stay tuned uh, these are the links to Vite and Repress and hopefully uh, this talk explains everything thank you bye